Hey, what's up, uh, what's up, everyone? It's me, Celeste Uchia here. Uh, as always, you know, uh, follow me to follow yourselves. Hopefully, we'll get there together. Today, I'm sitting on this awkward ass stool. Um, yeah, so I'm actually just getting ready to go out, get some groceries and stuff like that. A friend of mine that I talked to online, shout out, how's it going? I ho hope your day's doing good. They're dealing with something. They have a situation where a young person, or let's just say any individual, is uh, in distress and whatnot, and they're currently in a situation where they have no housing, and they're looking for resources to get housing for this person, whether it's a temporary basis, like a crash bed situation, a situation where you go to a location uh, and they provide you with housing or beds for the evening or a week period or something like that, or whether it's longer term housing, uh, you know, uh, some form of social housing and uh, public supportive infrastructure, that sort of thing. So there's an individual that's in distress and my friend is looking for resources for them. And um, I was just going to actually tell you about a quick uh, experience that I had that was very similar to what they're dealing with right now. And um, <clears throat> why it's important is because Sometimes our perception of reality, our belief systems, or our moral judgments can impact how other people are treated. It can treat them as uh, lesser individuals than ourselves. They can be denied the same dignity we give ourselves, the same forms of freedoms, luxuries, and social power and privilege. Um, because at times we judge their entire humanity based on our own moral code or some behaviors we don't like or a situation or something that happened or possibly their identity those sorts of things and um, I again I want to issue a warning here I don't think that we should judge other people I think rather we should see ourselves in other people's shoes and what I mean by that especially when I read existentialist philosophers and stuff like that is that you know there's a lot of <coughs> aspects to being human there's there's a it's heavy it's it's dark it's not all just one way or direction and people make a lot of different choices and stuff and we're often not privy to their experiences the relationships all of the legacies that came before why people are in a certain situation or why they make certain decisions or why they have a certain lifestyle certain behaviors or those sorts of things or again we might be judging them based on our moral codes and perception of the world and perception of reality and our answers that we give for ourselves, which I'm not trying to say change what we believe, but what I'm trying to say is don't apply what we believe to other people in a judgmental form, in a detrimental form, okay, if that makes sense, don't apply negative labels, stereotypes, and judgments to other people based on their appearance, or based on their lifestyles, or based on their identity group, or based on the community that they run with, or some given behaviors or stuff like that, because at the end of the day, we're all human beings, and we're all human all too human if that makes any sense because what we should strive to do here is see ourselves in the other person's situation and understand that they are a human being just like us and they've made choices and maybe if we had lived some of the lives experiences and legacies that they've had to face we would have made some of those similar choices as well too but right now we're not understanding it because we use a level of judgment from our own experiences, our own belief systems, our own moral codes, or our ways of understanding the world, and that sort of thing. Everyone's entitled to their own, but that's where freedom can be in conflict, and where one person's freedom can impact another person's freedom, or where somebody else's dignity is being denied. So we've got to be careful in those instances. And so here's my story time sort of example. <clears throat> I uh, had a couple of wonderful friends uh, Janie Bearden and my former partner Louisa Valdez who the three of us helped to organize and support uh, a free school project in East London and we had a huge community that was around us and they supported us too and they they worked we all worked together in a collective sort of fashion and we had a space in East London on Dundas Street we were actually renting the East Village Arts Collective and we would gather every Wednesday night from 5 till about 10 or 11 p.m. and just do all types of different programming. People would say, I want to give a lecture. I want to do a salsa class, a salsa dancing class. I want to do a cooking class. I want to do a walk down the street to show historic buildings. All these sorts of different things. People had all their different ideas and we just tried to make it happen in that space. Going back to what I'm talking about here, 
I was at school and I came home and I grabbed like I think a television and different stuff because we were going to show a movie and I went down to the school and when I arrived at the school to open the space for the evening I saw a person in distress on the street as is commonplace in East London here. East London uh, you know in, in my city of London Ontario we face a high degree of poverty and uh, you know there's there's lots of issues around substance abuse and other things uh, where individuals just need some support sometimes but anyways there was a person that was on the street and they were clearly in a lot of distress and some of their clothing was ripped and, and, and parts of their body were kind of exposed and stuff and so I had you know made a note of that in my head and I had opened the space and removed all the stuff that I had in the car locked the door went right back and talked to them because they were only you know five or six storefronts down you know what I mean uh, so started talking to them they were just casually like smoking a cigarette and they seemed okay but they were telling me that they were in distress and they were having a hard time but they seemed kind of out of it and stuff <clears throat> and uh, as we were talking I noticed that they had like like some some wounds on them with some blood and some different stuff and the more that we got talking the more sort of distressed they had seemed and and they were revealing stuff about their situation and their circumstance that they had just been in that seemed really you know kind of precarious or dangerous for another word right so the, and they had nowhere to turn or go so I saw another member from the free school a gentleman named Bob one of our friends great guy he came in and and he kind of saw me talking to this person as well and uh, so we, we were like, why don't you just come over to the free school and come hang out at the free school for a while and stuff. And so uh, that's what happened. The individual came and uh, like we had our front, evac's quite a large space. We had a front area where we were doing the programming. There was a middle space uh, with like, I don't know, uh, kitchen stuff and a couch and different stuff in the back here. And that's where that person went and kind of hung out. And they had a door so they could be kind of private because again, some of their clothes were kind of in tatters and exposing themselves and uh, the thing is you know both me and Bob happen to identify as men and you know that sort of thing and so this person wasn't of the same you know necessary gender identity as us and so with some of their clothing and some of their stuff going on it was kind of in a situation where we were didn't you know want to do too much but also just kept verbally asking what would you need we would knock on the door and that sort of thing because when somebody's in distress you want to give them the respect of giving them their own sort of space and privacy and agency you don't want to just force yourselves upon them even though they looked you know in a pretty bad shape and uh, I had known that my partner and friend at the time Louisa who uh, was also you know she went to medical school and stuff like that and she was actually working uh, in the phlebotomy field so like taking blood and doing all that stuff at the time and she was coming like suited up as nurse because she was just coming from her job actually you know and then we were going to go home together that night but anyways she got there and she went and she you know spoke to this person and it was uh you know within a few minutes that this whole thing had happened and once louisa got there it was nice because this person had an individual of a similar identity <clears throat> and who could relate to some of the things she was talking about in terms of male violence towards women in terms of uh unequal power relations where uh, a man can be violent towards a woman and then a woman uh, as a result of the unequal power relations has no place to go that evening or no financial means to then support herself uh, in different ways and, and so uh, there was also the issues of you know substance use and stuff and so Louise was talking to her and we collectively you know we knocked on the door we collectively all sort of four of us at that point decided on a strategy how we were going to help this person and um, we called around, we found a space that had, you know, availability for them. And uh, I'm not going to name the organization because I don't want to call them out or anything like that. Uh, this is sort of like a call-in thing rather than, you know, saying they're wrong. I just want to talk about the behavior so maybe we can respond differently. So this organization, we called them, and one of the first things they said on the phone, because we had informed them that the person was, you know, under a great deal of trauma and had also been medicating and that sort of thing, and uh, was kind of you know out there with the behavior and they were upset they were like well they can't come here and we we're like but you're the only location especially a service directed for women and they were like well there's two choices they can be sober and come here or we can call law enforcement on them those are the two choices that's it so this person clearly wasn't in a condition of sobriety it's just and they probably wouldn't be for several hours but here's the bigger concern 
when they were on the street prior to them coming into free school, and this was the biggest reason for asking them would they like to come to the free school, police were circulating around the neighborhood and they were going to apprehend this individual. Now, for the most part, when a police officer or, uh, you know, the police approach situations of substance use, people who are homeless and people who are also engaged in perhaps precarious behavior or some of their words are kind of crazy and they're doing stuff, one of their primary responses is to criminalize these individuals. They don't give them opportunities to just chill out and hang out for a while in somebody's living room on a couch and talk their situation out for a few hours and then go figure out, hey, let's get some housing, let's do that sort of thing. The first thing they do is put them in the back of a cop car under arrest, give them charges for like loitering, trespass, resisting arrest, even though they're not resisting arrest. You have no right to arrest them in the first place. They're in distress. That's a distinction you're failing to make these punitive forms of justice. And so they had, they were in the situation, they were like, I need to get off the street. We were like, we have a space. They came in, they had chilled out for a while, but it was clear it was going to take an entire evening or so for them to, you know, really get their stuff together because it was even hard talking to them at some points. Regardless, they're a human being. Like you would ask them if they wanted water, you, you hook them up. You know what I mean? We were actually sharing some snacks. We made them a plate of food and stuff like that. And so, um, <clears throat> About an hour and a half passes, and there's a deadline at which time this organization will take people or not. They have a firm deadline. They have to be there, and it's 10 minutes to the deadline. Lucky for us, the organization is only four or five blocks down the street, and I have my vehicle. Um, so I cleared out the car, whatever's left over, so that I could get all four of us in the car there. We quickly drive over there, <clears throat> and... So it's, just, it's sort of a secure facility, not insofar that they have, like, you know, a checkpoint or anything like that, but they have a gate at the front, and they prefer, because it's a, uh, a woman's only service, they prefer that men stay at the gate sort of thing. Uh, no problems. So um, the person went up with uh, my friend Louisa, and um, the person was, like, treated as if they were, you know, a negative human being, as if they were a criminal, as if they were... Uh, lower than other human beings simply because of their circumstance, their lifestyle, their situation. So it was these service providers were judging them based on their own moral belief system or some code of the institution, but not recognizing their own humanity in this person and not seeing themselves in that person as a human being, which is a huge mistake. So the person was basically told, behave, like, like listen to what I'm saying and do all this kind of stuff. We're just going to bounce you right away. And so... She resisted slightly, and my partner kind of vocalized some, hey, this isn't fair treatment. You're a service specifically designed to do this kind of thing. It's your moral code that's impacting this person getting resources. And then they just said, well, you should leave, and literally asked them to go. And so they walked back towards the gate. And so me and Bob, you know, watched this transpire, and we're directly maybe three blocks away from the police station, and we're all thinking, well, now the alternative is this person is going to be thrown into police custody because the service providers here have used their moral judgments of another human being, which could be them at any time, to prevent them from accessing resources or to prevent them from having supportive institutions that they would otherwise have. And so <clears throat> that's that unequal power and privilege. And that's that moral judgments, our belief systems, our moral codes, our ways of looking at the world can impact and limit other people's freedoms because we don't see humanity in them. We don't understand all of the legacies of their life, relationships, experiences, the totality of who they are. We only judge them in abstract and then we deny them the same dignities, respects, and freedoms that we would for ourselves or the same institutional resources and social power that otherwise they would have. So <clears throat> this was quite a, a you know, a sticky situation, and I, I was very fortunate that when they came back, the four of us talked about it again for an instance, and we, we just repeated, please go up there and really sort of firmly sort of, you know, and to Louisa's credit, who is a wonderful human being and a fierce warrior, she went up there and she stood fast in her ground and asked to spoke to a second person at that facility. And so a second person ended up coming out, and later... The person who was in distress ended up getting in the facility, regardless of the sobriety of their condition and that sort of thing. And that is not to say that these institutions can't have codes about sobriety and substance use and those sorts of things for their own safety and for their organization, absolutely. But 
we're an anarchist free school group, and we recognize the fact that all a person needed was not being thrown into a jail cell or have some moral judgment saying, you can't sleep here tonight, just a couch or a space or just a set of friends to hang out with for a few hours. Who cares? whether their lifestyle choices are what we choose. Who cares what their moral code, belief system, or cultural adherence isn't what we prefer. The thing is, they are human beings. And we should never use institutional force and power to harm human beings in distress when we could otherwise support them. And like, everyone's got a couch, a chair, or five minutes to spend with somebody in distress. I'm not going to lie to you. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I hope this kind of rings true to where it needs to go, and um, much respect to everyone, you know, in the world out there trying to do anything really and not trying to harm other people. Uh, provided you're enhancing your own freedom while enhancing other people's freedoms, I got much respect for you. So, um, you know, I really hope my friend here, who's in the situation, gets some of the resources that I sent their way. Uh, you know, I'm not the greatest person in the world, and you probably morally judge me by my appearance, some of my lifestyle choices, or some of my language and ideas I present. But I'll tell you this, I certainly did send you those resources quick time, did I not? So uh, maybe that speaks for my character, and we should judge people by their actions, and um, you know, give them the same freedoms we give others, and ourselves. So uh, yeah, I don't want to rant too long. This is what I have to say on the subject. I hope you enjoyed this story time. Follow me if you want to follow yourselves. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube. The whole goal with that is I just want to make a few bucks to feed my cats and, uh, you know, pay their vet bills and, uh, you know, have a space for myself as well, too. So, um, that's what it is. Everyone take care out there. I'm the last Uchiha. Uh, I'll see you another day and in another life. Take it easy.